find something of value. A higher education community and reflectivity on intellectualization. How central this humanity is. Welcome to the Academic Citizen. I'm your host, Nosipum Gumezulu. In November 2023, the Academic Citizen hosted a virtual symposium entitled Sound Matters, an interdisciplinary exploration into audio knowledge production. This online symposium was hosted by the South African Research Chair in Science Communication, the Academic Citizen, and the South African Journal of Science. For us, there is a looming question underpinning our interest in sound studies how to reconcile between the diverse intellectual pursuits of researchers, the style conventions of academic research publication, and the available means of disseminating auditory and sonic forms for research publication. In this seventh season of our podcast, we're excited to explore the role of audio in creating possibilities for the dissemination of knowledge. Over the course of the season, you will hear insights from scholars from around the world presenting papers at the symposium, ranging from the role of sound and placemaking, to experiments with landscapes, as well as the history, science, and politics of sound. In our first episode, Professor Ikani took us to space to explore the universe of sound. The episode follows a research project studying the composition of the known universe. The project examines the outreach and communications efficacy of data sonification in astronomy, drawing on the data from NASA to think through the representations of data as sound. In this episode, we move from outer space to time travel into the epistemic debris of the past and think about radio archives from the colonial period with Luke Marafa. When we think of old radio archives, we often conjure up snap and crackle of static shortwave radio transmissions. Listening to sonic fragments that exceed speech Luke Marafa, a PhD candidate at Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis at the University of Amsterdam, pays close attention to counter-histories that have been erased from the surface level of speech. Undertaking close listening to know by ear, their doctoral research is situated at the intersection between sound studies, critical and decolonial archival studies, and takes queer and feminist approaches to care in archival research into account. The talk you're about to hear is titled Transcription as Curation, Listening for Emotions in Archived Radio Shows. Let's get into it. Thank you for having me today. My name is Luc Marafa. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam at the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis. And my presentation today is titled Transcription as Curation, Listening for Emotions in Archived Radio Shows. So I will begin by providing you with some more details about my research in colonial radio archives and the issues that arise from working with sounds kept from the colonial period. In light of this, I will then present you with a certain method of listening that I have been using, and I will describe how transcriptions have been instrumental to extending care to the archival materials I work with. I will then bring up a specific case study, which I will analyze with the help of Themio Dumosu's framework for attending to people encountered in archived visual documents. And what I will try to do is to transfer her approach to sound documents and explain the specificities of caring for sounding actors. What I'm presenting today is somewhat of a work in progress, so I'm afraid I'll be coming with mostly questions and experiments and not so many answers, but please bear with me as I develop my thought. As I've mentioned before, I am doing research on colonial radio archives, and the picture on screen right now contains radio sets built by amateurs in the early 1900s, although the period I focus on is much later, mostly around 1945. My research concerns radio programs broadcasted on shortwave, which very counterintuitively actually means long distance, and mostly from the French, Dutch, and British colonial metropoles to their respective colonies. And I'm for now mostly analyzing how these colonial powers intersect in Southeast Asia, although my work includes fragments from other regions as well, mostly because the archive is quite messy and you never know what you're going to end up with when you click on a recording. 
So since I am working with archives marked by the violence of colonialism, I am mindful of the discourses that emerge from the documents I am studying. While many radio scholars have focused on the bureaucratic and discursive elements of radio history to let stories and counter stories emerge from them, my focus has primarily been on sound. And what I mean by that is that a major part of my research time is spent listening to archived radio programs. And as I said, since I work with archives fraught with unequal power relations and multiple layers of censorship uh, in terms of who got to speak on air at the time, to say what, what would get cut out live or in post editing, and even what fragments have made it into the archive and which haven't. Uh, so because of all of that, I have had to actively think about how and what I am listening to. Uh, my focus has been to include sounds which exceed speech into my transcriptions. So today I will present two aspects of my work. The first one being, how do I transcribe the sounds I am working with? And the second one, how do I present the transcription in my written work in a way that accounts for ethics of reproduction? So the first question is, how do I transcribe the sounds I am listening to? The sound archive I'm studying are mostly held in European institutions. They contain radio shows, which predominantly consist of speeches and entertainment programs by colonizers or European nationals who are in support of colonialism. In the rare occurrence that a person subjected to colonialism makes a radio appearance, their speech is heavily controlled to fit within a narrative that glorifies colonialism. That is not to say that critiques of colonialism are never, are never present in such discourses, but that they are often expressed in coded ways or only partially available due to the multiple layers of censorship that I mentioned earlier. So when I'm listening to these sounds, what do I really hear? My work has been to move away from textual analysis and into sound analysis with the hope that sonic fragments that exceed speech can carry the traces of resistance and counter histories that have been erased from the surface level of speech. And this is a practice that relates to what Annette Hoffman co coined close listening. Hoffman defines it as following, and I quote, what I tentatively call close listening describes the attempt to know by ear, that is to grasp as much as possible of the audible features of a recording. This includes attention to recorded features which do not appear on the label, for instance, the sound of the pitch pipe, which indicates the speed at which the recording should rotate, the noise of a rotating cylinder or scratched record, which can deliver cues on how often the record has been played. And the list goes on in her text. So while Hoffman focuses on recordings kept on wax cylinders, where the medium is particularly tangible in sound, I focus on digitized radio programs from much later on. Therefore, I do not only attend to the medium itself, but also to the layers that I can hear within the recorded speech. And here I'm talking about emotions, stutters and hesitations, sighs and background noises. Later on, Hoffman specifies, and I quote again, however closely one listens, one cannot escape one's own position as a listener, which may lead to insensitivity or heightened sensitivity to certain aspects of the audible. Hoffman is thus suspicious of the historical transcriptions which accompany the recordings that she studies as they are shaped by the colonial mindset of the time. While recognizing the always personal and incomplete character of my approach as well, I have been applying her method of close listening to write transcriptions, which are evidently marked by my own embodied repertoire. They highlight certain ways in which emotions might be audible to me and maybe other, erase others that I cannot attune to. And here is one of the more basic examples of what my transcriptions look like. I transcribe the speech I have been listening to word for word. In the current case, it is Paul Teto speaking in 1945 on why one must know Indochina at war. I also pay attention to the sounds which exceed speech, such as stutters here, uh, faltering voices from emotion, or just what sounds like emotion in his voice. And I set emphasis on these nonverbal cues amplifying them to challenge the portrayal of the colonizer as a rational and unbiased person who has no emotional stakes in colonialism. This relates to the portrait of the colonizer that Alfred Memi draws. Memi details the inaugural sense of self of the colonizer, which gets eroded over time by the irreconcilable reality of the colonizer's illegitimacy. The colonizer's emotional investment in the glory of colonialism thus becomes a heightened site where this inner conflict plays out. 
This example, quite straightforward, as I do not have to extend too much care to the speaker who, in his emotional outburst, is still protected by layers of privilege. The situation becomes more tricky when it comes to recordings of people who are minoritized or marginalized, especially when the emotions that they express are framed in the program to support the colonial narrative of the empire. And here I would like to bring up a case study in particular and to approach it with the help of Timio Dumoso's framework for care in the archive. The case study I will present is a short interview with a young boy from Brazzaville who is asked to send his Christmas wishes to the little whites, and here I quote as well, of France. I will show you the transcriptions after detailing the theoretical framework. In her text titled The Crying Child, Odumosu, at the hand of a picture of a nameless crying child from Saint Croix, asks, and I quote, what is the best way to attend to violated bodies and biographies without replicating historical patterns of abuse. Intricately playing with questions of visibility, reproduction, and harm, Odumosu develops a framework of care that takes emotional justice into account in processes of digitalization of visual archives. One of the ways in which she enacts this framework in her own text is by blurring the picture of the crying child. Indeed, a large part of her argument consists in refusing to be complicit to the reproduction and some consumption of suffering black bodies. And I ask how to translate this method of care to sound, specifically in the reproduction and circulation of the transcriptions I make of interviews that dramatize the harm inflicted on black and brown bodies for the purpose of glorifying colonialism. How can I introduce these sound, frag sound fragments that I transcribe into text in a way that is careful, both caring for the speaker, especially when the speaker is a child, and being careful not to reproduce harm or participate in the libidinal economy of black suffering. And here is the case study that I wanted to talk about. It is my transcription and translation of a program which was archived under the title Madagascar and the Letters, although actually it contains a little message, Christmas message, uh, by a 13-year-old boy from Bacongo near Brazzaville, and it is broadcasted on Radio Brazzaville in 1945. It is quite violent, quite racist, carries a lot of histories of colonialism. And here too, I am applying the mode of transcription I had described earlier, which means that I'm trying to focus on the elements which exceed speech or on explicit mentions of emotions. But I think in this case, this method of curation is not enough. Indeed, just as with the crying child from Saint Croix that Odumosu writes about, this young boy from Brazzaville is framed as a site for the fantasies of whiteness of the children he is addressing in his message. He speaks not as himself, but as a little black child. One could even say a poor little black child, as his lack of material wealth is repeatedly emphasized. Unfortunately, while he does state his name, I have not been able to retrieve it on account of a combination of the bad quality of the audio file and the fact that I am a white European and I cannot decode a name which might have been audible to a Congolese person, for example. Uh, this set aside, and I recognize it is important in terms of who gets access to these recordings, as I'm happy to get back to it later, I would like to zoom in on the sentence, they are very sad and me, I don't dare to show my own joy, which the boy states in light of his peers loss of their fathers in the, to the Second World War. Here we witness how the boy curtails his own emotions. One could read that as a form of emotional protest, a refusal to show joy while the exploitation and death of colonial soldiers from the war in Europe is ongoing, and a call for the attention of the ripple effects of these deaths on the emotional lives of children in Bakongo, where he lives. I conceive of this refusal in Odumosu's words as, and I quote, a sonic disruption that resists the terms of negation and dispossession, end of quote, in which the child is being framed. I realize this is an instance of textual analysis rather than a sound one, so I'll get back to sound now. And I would like to ask again, how do I extend care to this child beyond reframing his speech? What does an editorial blur look like when it is sound transcribed into written text? And while I do not have a straightforward reply to offer you, I can present you with one of the methods I have been experimenting with and I can present it while we listen to the program. These are short messages broadcasted on the radio by Dutch women and girls to their sons, brothers, or partners fighting in the Indonesian War of Independence in 1945. 
Lieve jongen, met ons alles goed. Ali is niet erg prettig. Kan nu niet spreken. Vele zoenen van moeder. Ali, Rie, Corrie en kinderen. Annie, Henny, een stevige handdruk van vader en Wim. Een groet van de familie. Dag schat. Dag lieve Tiri en dikke zoen. Een koeltje. Dag. Dan heeft Koenie dit allemaal schitterend afgebracht, hè? Het tweede bezoek aan Amsterdam is de stemsoort voor Jan Koen. Dit is iets voor de stadscompagnie 3-1-RI. Koeken, even luisteren naar je vrouw en dochtertje Mieke. Hier is je vrouw. Dag lieverd, hier is Beep. Groeten van allemaal. Nog een paar maandjes, joh, het is gebeurd hoor. Graag zou ik nu even bij een kijkje willen nemen, Mim. Hoe is het daar? Goed? Liefste, ik moet eindigen met een gemeene welterustseizoen van mij, van Beep. Dag. En dan is hier Mieke. Dag papi, kom je gauw naar huis en dan naar de zoen op je neus van nu aan hem. Mieke. Goed al vegen die natte zoen. In this excerpt from a text that I wrote recently, the sections in black, as I said, are my own words, uh, and they cover the more harmful or problematic parts of the radio program that appears in grey. Uh, these speeches are loaded with emotions and nonverbal cues. Um, so here too, I emphasize these sounds, which exceed speech, by putting them in bold and brackets, and those are also the only ones that I translate, in an attempt to prioritize them for the reader as well. This, I would say, amounts to a form of editorial blur, as I am leaving the non-Dutch speaking reader estranged from some of the meaning of the speech while letting the parts that I consider relevant transpire. But this also raises questions, since I am working with expressions of solidarity with people fighting for the continuation of colonialism. Here, it becomes tricky to navigate care for genuine expressions of worry and love, which challenged the narrative of colonialism as being a project that had the wholehearted support of the Dutch population, especially the working class, which experienced the brunt of the violence, all the while being mindful of not feeding into a narrative that reads resistance to colonialism where it wasn't necessarily present in an attempt to redeem Europeans from the guilt of having perpetrated crimes and genocides in their colonies. So as I said in the beginning, my presentation probably offers more questions than it does conclusions, but I hope I have managed to shed some lights onto some of the issues that I am encountering when working with sonic fragments of radio programs from the colonial period, as well as the creative methods that can be applied to them so as to let them be sources of knowledge against colonialism. <laughs> What is at stake in listening to colonial archives full of historical imbalances of power in representation? Records of the past in all societies are always incomplete. So when researchers who specialize in studying the past have to work with traces or remains of the past that they find, they are reading, and in this case, listening between the lines. Luke's work on colonial radio archives does just that, and it invites us to think about the ethical considerations in navigating the sonic representations of the past. Drawing on the work of Temi Odomusu, which uses blurring and redaction techniques to subvert how we engage with colonial photographs, refusing to reproduce the libidinal pull towards reproductions of violence against those already refusing subjugation. I'm reminded here of Bell Hooks' reflections on the oppositional gaze, and I wonder, as I listen to Luke, what an oppositional listening practice can sound like. So when we're identifying sonic traces of the past, what we're doing is the work of paying attention to assumptions about racialized difference, which inform theoretical orthodoxy about colonial relations. So when I'm listening to Luke, I'm reminded of the work of Professor Zina Makobane, who focuses on how we theorize as much as what we theorize when we engage with archival materials. In Makobane's work, Which Bodies Matter, she takes a step back from an obsession with Sarah Batman's body as a site from which to project numerous debates. And instead, Makobane asks us to consider how we approach our scholarship that allows particular things to come into view. So what we're gazing at, what our ears are trained to listen for, and what is occluded by not asking these questions. In Makobane and Luke's work, our attention is closely drawn to process. We're asked not to be satisfied with accepting power relations of representation as static. We're asked to dig to figure out how, when, and where particular gaze and listening regimes are made. 
So in Luke's work, to treat transcription of colonial archives as curation rather than positivist retrievals of the past, which feign objectivity whilst upholding coloniality's power, is to make clear that our listening is anything but neutral. To think of archives as historically specific cultural creations is to refuse a positivist reading of colonial archives and engage in care work when we listen. This care work is both wounding and healing, but it offers us a different relation to the dead, the living and those yet to come. To listen carefully with Luke is to consider our current global moment where the discursive debris of coloniality's power sits thick on our tongues. As we listen otherwise, we are urged to think together about what it means to contend with the recursive manifestations of empire today. For Luke to ask this in Amsterdam is invariably for us to ask this in Gaza and Palestine, in Goma and the DRC, in Janina and Sudan. Subverting colonial archives is to do the work of serious questioning of existing basis of so-called post-colonial relations and to engage in sustained refusal of unjust distribution of power. Refusal acts as a response not to render marginalized communities legible commodities in our archives, but to relish in the subversive power of paying close attention to coded critiques. Sitting in Johannesburg, the questions Luke's work raises have strong bearings for the work that we're doing here at the Academic Citizen. While there is much talk about the democratization of knowledge in the digital age, it still begs the question, what is the role of audio-led research practice and research outputs in a world with ongoing mass violence and experiences of collective suffering? How do we listen otherwise in this moment? For Luke, undertaking attention to sound that exceeds speech such as non-verbal vocalizations, such as silences, hesitations, sighs, and gasps, is a way through to think about how we convey emotions and reactions without relying on spoken words alone. It allows us to think about the practice of transcription that is deeply conscious of positionality and does more than just simply reproduce colonial imaginaries, but affords new translations and new interpretations. I'm so enlivened by the provocations that this work presents And we thank Luke for sharing it with us. This episode of The Academic Citizen was hosted by me, Nosipom Gomezulu. It was produced and promoted by Fumani Jwara and edited by Andre Burnett. The Academic Citizen is funded by the South African Research Chair in Science Communication, which in turn is funded by the South African National Research Foundation. We thank Luke Marafa for their presentation at Sound Matters Symposium in 2023. We thank them for allowing us to include their sonifications on this podcast. You can listen to all our podcasts, including our archive of previous seasons at www.theacademiccitizen.org. And you can follow us on all socials at The Academic Citizen. We welcome feedback at our email address, theacademiccitizen at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.